It can feel hard to be empowered, right? Even in the best of circumstances. But feeling self-confident in the face of criticism and rejection can be extra difficult. And unfortunately, within science and academia, criticism is an everyday occurrence. What you see here is an example of a rejection letter. It's not one that I personally received, although I've certainly received many. In the best of circumstances, criticism, rejection letters, they can push you to address challenges that you haven't thought of before and to make yourself and your ideas more clear. This particular letter is an exceptional one, though because it was actually given to a team of researchers who went on to win a Nobel Prize for the work that was not accepted. Rosalind Yalo was one of the lead researchers in the group. She was born in the 1920s, a religious minority and a woman who wanted to become a physicist. She did pretty much everything right in order to get into graduate school. And yet, despite excellent grades and even learning how to type so that she would be more attractive as a helper in the lab, had difficulty finding a spot and only because one of her undergraduate professors intervened was a university finally able to accept her, but with the warning that they would not be able to guarantee that she could find a place of employment after graduation. Well, she definitely showed them. She invented the radio immune, uh, uh, assay, which is an important technique in health and sciences, and has been used in, for example, uncovering endocrine problems. It's not surprising, given this history, that when she did receive the Nobel Prize, she talked a lot about the struggles that women had had in science. And in that background, she said, but if women are to start moving towards that goal, we must believe in ourselves or no one else will believe in us. We must match our aspirations with the competence, courage, and determination to succeed. And we must feel a personal responsibility to ease the path for those of us who come afterwards. And then she went on to say something else that I think should have meaning for all of us. She was talking about the context of women. But for everyone who's ever struggled with feeling empowered and whether or not they should continue to pursue their passion and try to make a difference in the world. She said, the world cannot afford the loss of the talents of half its people, or I would add any of its people, if we are to solve the many problems which beset us. And in fact, we know from a history of social science research as well, that having more people, more diverse people addressing problems, addressing big problems, is a real key to success. In 2014, the Scientific American published a nice article, I encourage you guys all to read it, that reviewed work from multiple labs. Two of the studies talked about the impact of diversity on improving a group's thinking or even individuals' thinking. In one case, they gave groups of three, so three members in each team, a murder mystery to solve. Each one of the team members had a unique piece of information. The teams that were more diverse approached the situation with the idea that they needed to share knowledge. They didn't assume that they all had the same information, and so they were able to come to better conclusions. In addition, another group also used this murder mystery technique and asked people to prepare an argument. Who did they think had, had committed the crime? Prepare an argument and try to convince someone else that you're right about it. Well, what was really amazing is that when they paired people with other participants that they thought had the same political standpoint as them versus an opposing political standpoint, those who were paired with someone that they thought thought differently about something completely 
completely unrelated to the murder mystery at hand. They prepared better, they spoke more clearly. I think it's easy to see that in addressing complex problems, it's useful to share information and also to think things through. There are other reasons why diversity of experience can be important to science. One of my favorite examples of this, and I think one of the previous speakers also spoke about not putting people into boxes, that people can be more than one thing. So perhaps some of you think of yourselves as scientists. Perhaps some of you think of yourselves as artists. Perhaps some of you think that's nonsense. I can be both. I can be more than just one. Well, Ramon y Cajal was someone who originally started out his life actually a not very good student and only interested in art. But his father, a medical doctor, had a feeling that if he brought him to cemeteries, because in those days you could also see corpses at cemeteries, he might become fascinated, his artist eye might become fascinated with the human body. And that is exactly what happened. He went on to help the world learn that the brain is not comprised of one big cell, but multiple thousands of neurons. This is one of his drawings, and you can see how much art inspired his work. This idea that in science, people often start out with some passions or interests and end up somewhere else is, at least in my experience, fairly common. The half face that you see right there is one of my mentors, Michael Meany. He's probably one of the most famous psychiatric neuroscientists known at this, at this uh, day and age. He started out his career as a clinical psychology student. And although he was fascinated by mental health and by solving problems, it turned out that he was, by his own admission, a pretty terrible clinician. And why was he a terrible clinician? Because he was fascinated by figuring out what was wrong, but wasn't as good at helping people solve what to do next. For some people, that might have made them shy away. It might have made them say, oh, psychology, mental health, that's all baloney, I'll go do something else. Or it might have made them feel like a failure. But that's not what happened with Michael. Instead, he began an amazing line of research, looking at rodents, exposed to more positive or less positive situations, experiences, st stress hormones that went along with less positive situations, and even parenting behavior that went along with more or less stressful environments. And what he found was really remarkable, he and his colleagues. One of the things that he found was that Stress hormones, stressful experiences, and even the kind of maternal behavior associated with those things, that that could change the physiology of the developing rat pup to ultimately affect their brains and to affect areas of their brains important to things like emotion as well as learning and attention. And beyond that, he also uncovered that part of the mechanism through which this happened involved changes in the DNA, changes in the methylation of the DNA, the chemicals surrounding the DNA, how easy it makes it for the body to read the DNA signals and turn those into things like proteins and ultimately behavior. And this was pretty revolutionary on two fronts, right? In psychiatry, we're linking these ideas that our actual experiences in caregiving can affect our eventual mental life through physical changes in the brain. And in the world of epigenetics, 
he was also uncovering a mechanism that normally had been associated with other kinds of outcomes. And so he received a decent amount of, feed, of, of criticism, to say the least. But what Michael has told me is that that criticism, actually he embraced it. He felt empowered by the attention that other colleagues were actually paying to his work, the time that they were taking to take it seriously and criticize it and give him ideas to move forward. And so instead of shying away, that's exactly what he did. His work had a big impact on me in graduate school. I was studying parent-child relationships and I was very interested in trying to understand what were the mechanisms through which experience shaped eventual well-being and mental life in humans. Could we see the same pathways that Michael had seen in these rodents in little babies. About 10 years later, I had the chance to ask these questions along with Michael and other colleagues, such as my friend Anchi Chu. Whoops, sorry, I went a little bit ahead. You got a sneak peek. Um, so what you can see here is the basic structure of the first set of experiments. I wanted to focus on the hippocampus which was that same area of the brain that Michael had found in, in the rats to be affected by parenting and to see if the same kind of things, if stress and parent-child relationships associated with stressful experiences could also leave a mark on the human brain. This was exciting and also terrifying because it's pretty terrifying to actually get to do the thing that you've been wanting to do for almost a decade. And then we got results, and those were both super exciting and also a little bit terrifying all over again. Exciting because we actually did see that there was an association between the kind of parenting that we saw in the lab and the hippocampus, this area that's important to stress regulation and memory and learning, as I mentioned before. But for those of you um, who are paying keen attention, you can see that the arrow of that, the, the direction of that less than or greater than sign is maybe a little bit funny, right? We normally think that better experiences, that bigger is better, right? That, that the things that, that we expect a better experience to lead to more growth. And what we actually saw was that the children who had been exposed, the infants who had been exposed to better experiences, their hippocampi were actually smaller. And so that really forced us to look at other literature and to think, why could this be? Well, if you think about your lives, the larger environment, context, if things are going really, really well, if your world is very safe, if you feel especially supported, it may not be as important to invest in areas of the brain that help you regulate stress, that help you learn that something very dangerous has occurred and to never ever do it again. And so that got us thinking, are these stress hormones also telling, kind of telling the brain, hey, things are tough. You need to speed up. You need to get your act together. You don't have time to grow up slowly. You need to grow up quickly. And by the way, while you're at it, you better make sure that you're prioritizing things to make you street smart, not necessarily book smart. So in a way, this made sense, but it also was a bit disconcerting. And later, a few years later, when other groups started finding very, very similar things, I definitely breathed a huge sigh of relief. Likewise, in my own research, I continued to investigate these kind of ideas using behavior. Now, one of the things that I was interested in was, would infants show memory similar to what we saw with that area of the brain? Would 
relatively better experiences lead to less of a priority of investing in memory at a young age. Any of you guys who are brothers or sisters or a few parents out here, you probably know it's very difficult to make infants talk. No matter how much you ask a six-month-old, hey, do you remember this? You cannot get them to answer you. They just won't do it. But what you can do is you can show them pictures of different objects. So what we see on the far, your far left of the screen is items superimposed over scenes. And then after we showed the babies those items and scenes, we showed them one of the scenes with multiple images superimposed on it. And just like what we saw with the brain, we saw that people who had received a little bit less sensitive and responsive care were actually doing better on this task. And then we saw something similar again. We gave preschoolers a fake lizard and made it jump. And we showed them, of course, that the lizard was not, they, it was clear that the lizard was not going to hurt them. And it wasn't even real. And we repeated this time and time again. The kids who had had the slightly less sensitive and supportive parenting interactions as babies, they actually really remembered the danger that they perceived with that lizard. And unlike other children, they stayed afraid of it over time. Because, well, that makes sense, right? If your environment is scary, if you think that you are going to approach more dangers or more things that you have to do, deal with on your own, it makes sense to remember them, to really take them quite seriously. And finally, a most recent experiment used that same kind of design as what we had done with the babies, where we showed preschoolers pictures of animals and emotional children. And we asked them later, because now they can talk, right? Which animal did you see with that girl before? And as you might now be ready to expect, we found that the kids who had had slightly less sensitive and supportive care actually showed better memory for those emotional associations. And kind of why wouldn't they, right? It makes sense that they're prioritizing that kind of information. Importantly, however, girls who we sh did a very similar experiment with but showed them pictures of food instead of the emotional faces and asked for memory, they actually performed worse. And that tells us something very important. That it's not necessarily that experience is good or bad, or experience makes us smart or dumb, or good or bad, or bigger or smaller. What it may do is help us prioritize the kind of things that we think and the types of information that we focus upon. And that, I think, is extremely important, not just to science, but also potentially to education, policy, parenting, clinical work, et cetera, et cetera. There is a model that suggests that we need to get on the right track, right? That there's a destination that we want to get to, and if we're on the wrong track, we need to switch back over so that we can have the kind of life and achieve the kind of goals that we want. But I think what this kind of work is starting to point to is that actually life and what we prioritize is more like a tree. And so we might want to get to the top left, but that doesn't mean we all have to take the same exact path. There are many ways that we might achieve our goals. And one of the things that we can do in our schools, in our societies, is to help identify the different strengths, the different strengths from different experiences that might enable people to be them, their best selves and achieve their goals. For me, a couple years back, I was at a conference, an international conference, and for a variety of reasons, within about two hours, I was, I was asked, 
hey, can you fill in for the keynote speaker? Which is kind of a nerve wracking, not super empowering situation um, in that moment. It turned out to be one of the most empowering experiences of my entire life. And it was because of a wonderful clinician who stood up at the end of the talk. I had presented some of the same kind of research, this idea that perhaps adversity may actually lead to different kinds of strengths. Not my own idea. Many other people have been talking about this as well. But it was the first time that this clinician had heard it. And he said, I want to thank you for telling me about this, because now I can go back to my patients, my patients who think that there is something wrong with them, who think that their brains failed because of the way they responded to the experiences that they've had. And instead, I can tell them, hey, actually, your brain was making the best out of the situation it had. It was trying to adapt to do well. Now the challenge is just to try to have it adapt to a new situation. And that that, he said, will make them feel empowered. And that was wonderful to hear. So for me, it was a moment where hopefully a lot of the findings that I've published will stand the test of time. Maybe they won't. But they add to a larger story that will be beneficial, hopefully, to many, to many people. And so I'd like to return to that quote earlier, this idea that can the world really afford to lose any of us in the struggle to make things better? That each one of us only if we speak out, only if we share our knowledge, only if we accidentally give a keynote speech can, can we actually, will our voices be heard and might they make a difference? The best analogy that I can think of for that is one that was not originally designed to talk about empowerment through science, but I think is really a perfect metaphor. Some, whoops, sorry, some of you will be familiar with this parable. And as I said, I think it rings true for science as well. There was a blind monk who encountered an animal in the road. He reaches out, touches it, feels something hard and solid and says, it must be a wall. Another monk reaches out and touches, feels, feels the wind blowing, the ear is flapping, says it must be the wind. Another feels the tail. He feels something like a, a, a whip. It must, it must be a tail. Another, oh, touches the trunk. There's a snake. Each one of them was partially wrong and partially right but only by being empowered to say what they thought was the truth could the listener of the story get a sense of the real situation, the real animal, the real answer in the middle of the road. Thank you. <laughs>